seat tonight and stand together as we worship. My hope, my life, my strength is in you, Lord. Here we go. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you. rainy night in Texas. My goodness, how long has it been since we came to church on Sunday and it rained all day long? It's just been a long time, but, but what, a, what a blessing God has seen fit to pour out on us this weekend and what a, what a joy to be able to make up the deficit that we've been running. And, and for some of you, uh, to be able to wear a sweater somewhere else than in our church service on Sunday morning or Sunday night. Uh, it, it is a, a glorious day out there, and we're very grateful and thank the Lord for what he's doing in us and around us, and uh, it's been a good day already. Uh, a couple of announcements that I want to just remind you about. We're a week out, but next Saturday night into Sunday morning, uh, we will revert from daylight saving time back to Central Standard Time. Our, our legislature, national legislature, has played with this, talked about this, threatened to leave it year-round, and y'all know they can't agree on anything these days, so it, it's still in place. So uh, daylight saving time will end, and we will go back to Central Standard Time. So by this time at 6.04 next Sunday night, it will have been pitch black dark for 30 minutes. Okay, that's just the way that it will, it will be. But don't forget to set your clock back, or you might be early for church. The, uh, the Thanksgiving banquet is just around the corner. You might have noticed as you came in the front doors that our, our folks with our hospitality committee are there taking your sign-ups to bring the, the side dishes that flesh out the meal. And we look forward to a great time of worship, fellowship, and a tremendous meal together on that Sunday evening, November 19th, there at the Civic Center. So we, we do, we're looking forward to a good time together. I'm glad that you're here. Trish, you've got family with you tonight, right? You got your mom and your sister, your baby sister, your little sister. Uh, on yesterday at First Baptist Church in Winsboro, uh, the service for Jeremy's dad was held, and I, I learned so much about my friend. I, I thought I knew him. And I realized on yesterday, I had just begun to scratch the surface. And, and I wish I'd had the presence of mind to take notes and to draw charts. It would have been very helpful as we were 
It's on Facebook, so I could go back and listen to it again if I wanted to. All right, that's, but it was a, a tremendous service and just a testimony to his dad's life, and I'm grateful. And so extended family have come in, and we're glad y'all are here. It's so good to have you with us in worship tonight. And I can't believe that you wanted to go hear Jeremy preach this morning rather than to come here and listen to me. That blows my mind, mother-in-law. That, I, wow. Okay, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> All right, well, let's continue our time of worship together tonight in the Word, uh, in this passage from Matthew. Let's stand together, and I invite you to say this together with me. Matthew 16, 15, and 16, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 15, and 16. Take a moment, say hello to someone you've not yet greeted as we continue our time of worship together tonight.
in your presence. In your presence, all our fears were washed away. Washed away.
As we pray together tonight, we pray, I hope, fully aware of God's faithfulness and his blessing. Watching him work, sustaining us, teaching us, keeping us. God being who God is. And we just see it and we can say thank you. But he's also very faithful in our difficult passages of life. And I want you to pray in particular tonight for Pat Talent and her family. I uh, got a call from her son, Jeff, just a little while ago. And uh, if you don't know, I mean, Pat was here with us on Tuesday, serving in our senior adult luncheon, making her way around the tables and, and just thoroughly enjoying herself. She just very recently enjoyed the Branson trip with our, our senior adults. But after that luncheon on Tuesday, she got sick and sicker and sicker and ended up in ICU in Tyler with a virulent case of pneumonia uh, and she'd become septic. When I talked to Jeff this afternoon, it was increasingly clear that all the measures that they had taken were being unsuccessful, that the ventilator was not doing what they had hoped that it would do and they were getting ready to begin the process of removing those life-sustaining measures. I don't know what that timetable will be. I don't know how that's going to look exactly, but I, he didn't expect, and I would certainly concur with him, that she will be with us very long. So pray for Jeff, her son, who has been in the middle of that fast-developing storm this week and who's had to make some very difficult decisions for a young man for his mother, and just pray for them as they navigate this season of life. But I know this, that our God is faithful even in the darkest of times, and he has been and he will be faithful to them. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for in so many ways reminding us how you work. Oftentimes we have to get a ways down the road and look back and go, wow. I didn't even recognize it then. I didn't even see it then, but there you were, and you were at work, you were teaching, and you were equipping, and you were providing, and you were preparing, and, and all the while it happened in the course of our walking with you and trusting you. Thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for your, your blessings, the ones that are good that we can quickly and readily number, and for those that come in the midst of our trials, our suffering, that take us a little while longer to recognize, thank you, God, for your faithfulness and for your blessing. For this time of worship tonight, I'm grateful, Father. It's good to be able to come together on this Sunday evening as the rain is falling outside to join together before you to worship a holy and right God. And as we come, I pray for Jeff and I pray for Pat. You know where both of them are and what both are dealing with and going through. And I just pray, Lord, that you will be merciful to Pat and that you will take care of her in that fashion that you are able to do. I pray for Jeff that you will sustain him, that you will give him both strength and wisdom in this difficult passage. We thank you, Lord, for what you've been up to and even what you'll do tonight. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together and sing. This is a beautiful hymn. How deep the Father's love for us. Let's sing together. How deep the Father's love for us. How beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretched treasure how great the pain of searing loss the mother turns his face away as wounds which more the Oh, my 
Thank you. I am increasingly convinced that James, like Paul, had a very positive outlook, a very optimistic expectation, a very hope-filled perspective on the church. Because first and foremost, his faith, his trust, his confidence was in his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He knew what the Lord was capable of doing and how he could change people's lives. He knew that. That was the underlying principle that guided what they wrote to those early churches. At the same time, he was realistic and honest and admitted that those of us who put on our church clothes and gather together for worship are not superhuman beings, are not people outside the mainstream of life. We are normal flesh and blood types. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We've been washed in the blood. We've been saved by grace through faith. All those things are true, but we are still mortal beings. And we are not immune to sin and the brokenness of sin. And so as he writes this letter, he writes with that optimism, challenging them to continue to become, to continue to walk with the Lord, but at the same time, to be wary of, mindful of the fact that Satan is at work around us and at times even in us to pull us away from God's best, to tempt us to succumb to Satan's ploys along the way that will destroy ultimately the fellowship of the church. His heart, I believe, his goal as he writes is that individuals who are a part of the body of Christ are going to be strengthened in their faith and at the same time that individual strengthening will result in a a corporate strengthening of the body of Christ. When we get to James chapter 3 and begin reading in verse 13, obviously some of your Bibles are going to have a little editorial heading added, two wisdoms contrasted, and that is the case. But there's a statement that he makes in the early part of this passage that prompted me to use the title, The Good Life. The Good Life. Now, what is the good life? If you had to, to describe that to somebody, how, how would you describe the good life that could be lived by any of us? Is it one filled with the accoutrements of the world, all the little goodies and prizes and baubles that can be obtained that make one's life good? Is it characterized by possessions, by experiences, by attainments, so that at the end of the day, when we look on our walls and there are those plaques and there are those recognitions, those certificates, we could say, it's been a good life. Is the good life characterized by morality? And good deeds. I, again, you've heard me say this before, and I'll say it again. I can't count the number of times that I have, in preparation for a funeral, where I was in doubt about the person's salvation, because there wasn't a lot of evidence. But I was lobbied by friends and family, mostly, who worked hard to convince me in the hours preceding the funeral that he, she, was a good person. And they lived a good life. Early on, I'd take that at face value. The older I get, the more I probe into that. What do you mean by that? Tell me more about that. And they'll describe a life that was a morally good life. And, and oftentimes that conclusion comes because that life is compared to others who lived who weren't quite so spiffy, who weren't quite so good. Is the good life a life that simply avoids the stains and stigma of our broken world? What, what is the good life? I, I'll tell you my definition has changed over the years because I, I used to be envious in my growing up, envious of people that I thought were living the good life. Will Gray and I were in elementary school together, and Will's daddy was a doctor. And at that time, I didn't know all that that meant. I just knew he worked at the hospital, but I knew that the house they lived in closer to downtown than where we live was a fine house. And Will Gray had a bedroom and a toy room. And when I went to visit Will Gray, we would go into the toy room and he had a bank of big 
drawers on one side of that room. And when you went to those drawers and pulled them open, they were chock full of toys. And I don't mean hand-me-downs. I don't mean El Cheapo toys. I mean toys. The kind that were in the Sears Christmas wish book. The kind that were in United Jewelers and Distributors in Shreveport, Louisiana. We're talking about primo toys. And, and I would go into that room and think, wow, wow, this is the good life. The good life. Well, I got over that and then had other ideas about what was the good life. You know, in, in high school, I, I drove daddy's pickup truck, that 1967 Chevy pickup, who by, which by that time had about 120,000 miles on it. And there was nothing overly manly about that, certainly nothing sexy about that, but one of my classmates drove up to school in a brand new blue Monte Carlo. It was as wide as this section of pews. It had a big, wide hood. It had a large, large engine. And it had a brand new eight track tape player. Factory installed, none of this late edition stuff. And, and it was new enough that the eight tracks had not begun to double track. He didn't have to have a piece of cardboard to stick in the gap to keep his on the right song. It was incredible. And I thought, wow, if I, if, oh, one day I, I want to have a car like that. And then my friend, who was a couple of years ahead of me, one summer he left because he was a little older than the rest of us. I think he'd been held back a time or two because he was, well, he'd just been held back. Anyway, he went to Alaska and he worked on the pipeline and he came home. And before his senior year, he bought a brand new four-wheel drive pickup. And I mean, it was jacked up off of the ground. He had a four-wheel drive pickup in the back. That day as he drove up in the school parking lot, he had a brand new three-wheeler. Three-wheeler, as before they invented four-wheelers. A brand new three-wheeler. And in the back window of that four-wheel drive jacked up pickup with a three-wheeler in the back in the back end of that truck, he had a gun rack with three brand new high-powered weapons. And I thought, ooh, one day, one day. I am so glad that God caught me before I jumped off into that pond and tried to swim into that good life. But for a, an impressionable kid who had, I'd really had a good life. I, I don't feel sorry for me. We had more than enough. But my ideas about what the good life was were way off base. The Lord began to teach and to shape and to mold and to refine. So when you get to the third chapter, verse 13, he began by asking this question. Who among you is wise and understanding? And that's the issue that we're going to deal with tonight. Who is then here's, here's the instruction. Let him show by his good behavior. The interpretation is, let him show by his good living, by his good life. Let him demonstrate by the way that he carries himself, by the way that she lives among family and with the church family and with friends. Let them show by their good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. We move forward. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom, that was just described, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Remember, and this is where I have had to come back again and again with this passage and with the book of James. Remember who he's writing to. He's not writing to primarily a, an unchurched audience, an unbelieving audience out there. This is a letter to the church. He's writing to people like you and me who have said, I want to follow Jesus. Writing to people like you and me who live in a broken world. We're not off on an island somewhere surrounded by uh, razor wire protected from the evils of the world. We live in a broken world. And we are not immune to its influences. 
And so we can very readily get carried off track. We can, we can get seduced by thoughts, by, by behaviors that, that keep us from being who we ought to be in Christ. And that, that influence, that drift, that spiritual drift, and, and that's, to me that's one of the scariest things in the life of the church. I don't particularly worry about some individual coming in this church with weird and wacky, wacky or acky ideas, weird and wacky ideas standing up and influencing a whole bunch of us to go with them and to split the church. I, I really don't worry about that. I think we are, we're pretty well protected from that. Here's what I do worry about. Good people like us, good people like those who gather with us in church on this Sunday morning who in the course of life get busy with, get caught up in, get distracted by, and slowly, very subtly, slowly, subtly, they began to drift away from the Lord. They've not renounced their faith. They've not said, I no longer believe. They've not even said, I don't want to be a part of the fellowship. But slowly and surely, they drift away from, from an intimate fellowship with God the Father. And as they do, there is a result. There is a consequence. And I, I believe James talks about that in this passage of Scripture. So there are, there are three questions, and uh, I want to ask them, and then we'll begin to answer them, and then we're going to go on and keep on answering them, I hope, as we walk away from here. What is the origin of, of that wisdom that guides your life? Well, before we answer that question, Let's clarify what I believe James meant by wisdom. For James, wisdom was, was being able to apply God's knowledge, what God has revealed to us through his word, through the working of his Holy Spirit, through what we learn collectively in the body of Christ. It is what we, what we do with that godly knowledge in application to the practical affairs of life. It is a spiritual common sense it is more than being able to talk the talk, more than being able to answer the questions in Sunday school, more than being able to pronounce the five-syllable words in the Bible and all the names in the Old Testament. It is much more than that. Is that a, it is that ability to take spiritual truth and apply it to life, to the hard issues, to the hard questions, to the hard situations in life. So we use that, that term, wise, who among you is wise, and then who is understanding? There's a subtle difference with that second word, but in using the term understanding, it was a, a word that often pointed to specialized knowledge, such as that of a skilled tradesman. And I like that idea too. I, like many of you, are, am a homeowner. And one of the challenges of being a homeowner is being able to maintain your home. And you don't want to have to call the man for every little thing that comes along. And so when the commode won't stop running, you want to be able to go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy the guts and replace the guts in your commode. Uh, when that faucet just will not stop that incessant dripping, you want to be able to disassemble that thing, replace that little O-ring, put it back together, and have it work appropriately. When the ballast goes out on the fluorescent light, you want to be able to get on the ladder and take out the ballast, reinstall it, put the lights back in, and have the light work again miraculously after that period of dimness in that room that you have been tolerating. You want to do that. You want to do that. You can't always do that. And it's a hard thing for an arrogant, self-sufficient man to break down and call the man. But sometimes you have to call the man. And I marvel I've called the man. He's come to the house. And in a few minutes, a few minutes, he's got the problem diagnosed. He's got the right tools. And he has fixed the problem. Casey, people like you make me sick. <laughs> they know which wires to grab and which ones not to grab. They, they know the little tricks of the trade that can, that can make things right and make them work in a, in a stellar fashion and, and make it happen quickly. And, and they're done. And you say, is that all there is? Yes, I'm finished. Because you, I worked on it for half a day before I quit. James had in mind that, that this wisdom, this ability to, uh, to know God's truth and then to apply it in life 
is, is that ability. I mean, you, you've got the tools. God has equipped you with the tools of the trade. And beyond that, he's given you the little insights into life that allow you to use those true tools to make it work. So we're, we're talking about the life that works. Faith that works is an overarching theme for this book. It, it's, it just functions well. It, it works exactly like God said it would work. And so he said, where, where does your wisdom come from? Because obviously there are times in the life of this church, there are times in the life of these people where they are colliding head on with each other. There are conflicts. There are times when decisions are made that are not wise decisions. And so he, he said, there is this, this earthly wisdom that we demonstrate from time to time. And, and it is a, a natural, it is innate within us because of our fallen nature, but it is demonic as well. It is, it is from Satan. And, and he's the one who shows up and whispers in our ear. He's the one who tempts us, seduces us to believe and to follow after him because his ways, his solutions sometimes sound good and they look very good. They're packaged very well. But then he compares that with a godly wisdom, the wisdom from above that wisdom that is indeed from God. Now, there's a contrast here, obviously. He's contrasted the values of the world and the values of the kingdom of God. And we know that the world and its wisdom is characterized by selfishness. It, it is that wisdom that encourages you to think first and foremost about yourself. I know we should. We've got to take care of ourselves. Great commandment, love God with everything you've got. The second is really close to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So you, you've got to have that ability to know who you are and to take care of yourself, but you don't want to be consumed by you as if you are the most important person in the room. I wonder how many of you sitting in here tonight think you're the most important person in the room. Do not raise your hand nor nod your head. Because if you do, if you think it's all about you, then obviously you've already been bitten by that green-eyed bug. You've been bitten by that worldly wisdom, whereas divine wisdom and the kingdom of God is characterized by a selflessness. And we'll explore that a little bit more in just a moment. What is the origin of your wisdom? But the second uh, question we would ask that, that then opens up this whole subject, what are, what are the characteristics of your wisdom? The wisdom that you've chosen, the wisdom that you practice. Earthly wisdom is characterized by, by two primary things. It's characterized by jealousy. And that's not hard to figure out. Because if, if we think, if I think, if you think that it's all about us, then it's very easy to become jealous of somebody else who might be getting the attention, who might be demonstrating a little bit more skill than you. I know you, you can't believe it. Uh, but there are, let's see, there's Ricky back there. And uh, I would, Butch, are you in here? He's outside. He's, he's watching for bad guys. Okay. Uh, and Jeremy's over here. I, I, uh, three, at least three preacher types. I may be omitting others. God forbid me. Forgive me. Believe it or not, preacher types get jealous of each other. Amen, gentlemen? Okay. Because... Because one of their people show up, one of their members show up. Oh, we've got the best preacher. Oh, he is so wonderful. His messages are captivating. He has such a grasp of the English language. He is so charismatic. It just draws you in when he's standing up there in the pulpit. And we, I, think to myself, well, I hope he chokes on his next message. Because you see, in our perfect world, everybody would come to our church because we've got the best church in town. Amen? We've got the best preacher in town. Amen? Don't feed this. God will get you for that, okay? But jealousy is born of selfishness because you want it to be all about you. And when it becomes about somebody else, then we're out, we're out to get them. But it's not only, not only jealousy, but then there is the accompanying selfish ambition. That goal that, that I want what I want. And more than that, I deserve what I want. 
because again, it's all about me. Divine wisdom, in contrast, is characterized not by selfishness, but by selflessness. And not by this messed up, uh, deluded mindset that it's all about me, but by a selfless purity. But the wisdom from above is first pure. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. The wisdom from above is first pure. Then it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's reasonable, it's full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. Earthly wisdom, godly wisdom. They coexist in the life of our church. They coexist in our lives. And the, the bad thing, if you will, about this earthly wisdom is that it doesn't wear a badge. It doesn't wave a banner proclaiming that it is indeed earthly wisdom more demonic than from God. It very subtly makes its appearance among us, and it makes its appearance by demonstrating these particular attributes that antagonistic spirit of self-centeredness, which is jealousy, that selfish ambition that leads to uh, a divisiveness, a, a fractious reality that, that separates us from one another. Let me stop there for just a minute. and don't want to belabor the point, but most of you folks have been around for a little while, and you've got a great deal of experience can you recall a time in the life of any church that you've been a part of where it seemed like the church had divided up into teams within the one church? There were various teams, and they all had their team leaders or coaches who might have been a Sunday school teacher. It might have been a lay leader. It might have been a staff member. But there was such a, an unhealth in the body that people were lining up around those individuals who, by the way, more than likely were being motivated by their own jealousy and selfish ambition, but who were drawing people in to be a part of them. And whenever you join a team, even in the context of a church, you want to win. Because nobody wants to be on a losing team. And in a church, if I'm going to be on the winning team and you're on the other team, then there's only one option. You've got to be the losing team, right? Right? And so I've got to figure out a way to beat you. I, I've got to figure out a way to win. And, and it might be a very subtle thing. It, we could even cloak it in Scripture. I love people who are mean-spirited and jealous and angry who quote Scripture all the time. Don't you? It just is a blessing. It's a blessing to my heart. I love crooked politicians, devious, crooked politicians who can say horrible things with one breath and quote Scripture with the other breath. It does not go together. It doesn't fit. Therefore, it's evidence of the fact that we have this really sick synthesis of both worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. But there is jealousy. There is selfish ambition. And then that issues in disorder. Chaos, if you will. Restlessness, instability, disturbances in the fellowship as that infighting goes on. And, and then he used the phrase, every vile practice, which, which would mean, mean meanness in thoughts, in words, and in deeds. That's the thing that happens. Again, we can cloak it in spiritual verbiage. We can make it sound like it's a noble thing. Well, I'm fighting for the cause. I'm standing up for what is right. But because of what it's doing to the body of Christ, because it's what it's, what it's doing to individuals in the church... It is evidence of the fact that this is not of God. God is not going to work to destroy his bride. And the church is the bride of Christ. And anybody who says, I love the Lord, therefore I must destroy this church, is a liar, and the truth is not in them. So he goes on to talk about godly wisdom. And my, what a contrast. Those words that he uses to describe it, pure. Jesus said again, blessed are the pure in heart. And that's, that's a, boy, a counter to, a contrast to jealousy because purity strips away that, that selfishness and it allows us to see what the Lord sees and to, to feel what the Lord feels. And, and it will not give rise to it. It will give no place to that selfish ambition which creates, creates that separation, the schism in the body of Christ. But it is peaceable. 
It's peaceable. Godly wisdom is peaceable. It wants, not at any cost, but it wants peace. It wants God's people to be able to coexist peacefully together for the cause of Christ. It wants to look for a way of avoiding those conflicts that pit us against each other. It is, it is peace-loving. It's peacemaking. And then it's also gentle. Uh, this, this godly wisdom is uh, able to get along. Now, remember, there are limits to this. It's not go along to get along and, and tolerate anything. This isn't putting up with anything and everything. This has got to be guided by the character of Christ, the, the working of the Holy Spirit in us. And we would never tolerate brokenness and sin just to get along. But y'all, we are all a work in progress. There's not a person in this room, and you are, you know, you're the gold star club, the cream of the crop, because you're here on Sunday night when it's raining. I mean, God's going to give you two gold stars for tonight rather than just one. I know that you are, you are that, that group of people, but you are not immune. You are not immune to pettiness and divisiveness. And so we fight that, not with our own strength, but we fight that with the strength of God's spirit. And as we look at one another, we realize, you know, they're flawed and so am I. But he is my brother in Christ, and she is my sister in Christ, and we are a part of the family of God. And I'm going to do everything I can to love them, to walk peaceably with them as we serve the Lord together. And I, as far as it depends on me, am going to look for that good that is in them, for that presence of Christ in them. And that makes a tremendous, a tremendous difference. He carried on beyond gentle. There, there was that openness to reason, that, that ability to listen, that willingness to listen and to grow and to mature and not feel like you have all the answers. There is that, that spirit of mercy that is active, that is present in the life of the one who has that, that godly wisdom, living with each other in a, in a full consciousness of the other person's neediness and helplessness. Remember, again, we're flawed, and it ought to be that we, rather than pick at each other and pick apart each other, we ought to come to each other's aid and do what we can to restore and to prop up, making us ready to forgive as we've been forgiven. Without uncertainty, without insincerity, he continued, just, just meaning that there is a steadfastness, there is a, a a willingness to carry on and not to be mixed, to not be diluted uh, with that earthly wisdom that is not of God. So what is the result? When we embrace one or the other, when we allow ourselves to be seduced by that earthly wisdom, what can we expect? Well, he was very clear. Uh, earthly wisdom produces disorder and every evil thing disorder. There is so much disorder in our world. And you know what it looks like? Whether it's on a talk show, a news talk show in the afternoon, or at a, a fracas that breaks out at a Halloween party. And again, y'all know, I've told you one of my favorite Friday night, Saturday night, go to bed shows is on patrol live where we follow police departments from around the country with 50 cameras and, and we keep up with their exploits live every Friday and Saturday night. And last night, y'all, they were rolling. They were going to call after call after, after call to Halloween parties that got out of control. Halloween parties. You knew what was coming. They'd tell you they're driving 120 miles an hour toward this party that's gotten out of control where there may be the presence of firearms and knives. You know there's going to be a group of people that are going to be out of control. Sure enough, they pull up on the scene and there they are, all these people who are now out of control and they are hollering, screaming at each other. You can't make out a conversation because they're all screaming at the same time. Again, it's very much like afternoon news talk shows, screaming at the talk all the time, raising their voices to be heard and nobody's being heard. And then the police jump in there and they're hollering even louder. Now what they had last night, and man, I like this. I wish I'd had this tool a long time ago as a pastor in a Baptist business meeting. They had, they had a paintball gun that didn't have paintballs in it. It had pepper balls in it. 
and they sprayed those pepper balls. And I'm telling you, it made a grown, big old girl cry and get on her knees and stop all of her stuff. It was impressive. I thought I could have broken up a lot of business meetings with that if I could just Wow. But people out of control who are demanding that they get what they want at the expense of everybody else. And our world today is demonstrating that again and again and again. I don't want to listen to you. I don't care what you have to say. I'm going to talk you down and I'm going to talk over you. And you need to, this is what they're saying. Don't quote me. This is what they're saying. You need to shut up and listen to me because what I think is more important than what you think. And that is the result of wisdom from below from Satan influencing and affecting. What's the result of wisdom from above? Divine wisdom produces the fruit of righteousness, right living, people following the Lord. And peace is the soil in which that seed of righteousness, that seed of righteous living is planted. Peace, not disorder, not chaos, not not schisms, no peace where people are are committed to living together in Christ, where we are being guided and controlled by the presence of the Holy Spirit, peace. And so we plant the seeds of righteousness in that. Let's do the right thing together in Christ, in that environment, and then watch the harvest come. And the harvest is right living, righteousness before God. And that's not just uh, an unattainable ideal that was held up in Scripture. Remember, one of the most practical writers in the Bible is James. And he wouldn't have held this up if he didn't know, if you seek it, you will find it. You know your heart. And he knows your heart. So don't lie to yourself and don't lie to him. Let's strive, seek to find that wisdom which is from above. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for our time together in worship tonight and for this powerful word that is so convicting, just shining a light on the the brokenness of our world, of our culture, our community. And Father, we don't want to be that translated into the church. We want to represent you and show the world what it looks like to walk with Jesus. Use this invitation even now to draw us to you, to to prompt us to commit, to prompt us to decide. And then, Father, we take the opportunity, we take the moment to come before you and to try to be obedient to you. In Christ's name we pray.